Alex Winter has been making feature-length films as an actor, writer, and director since the early 1990s. Best to know, best known to some as Bill from the beloved Bill and Ted films, Alex has become a formidable documentary filmmaker with a focus on the tech industry. His latest and perhaps most important documentary, The YouTube Effect, is presently streaming here in Australia. I'm really pleased to be speaking with him today. Hi, Alex. Hey, how are you doing? Good to see you. Alex, thank you for doing this. I really admire your work and I appreciate the really balanced and non-hyperbolic way in which you've been discussing this film and the plethora of issues that it shines a light upon. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. For folks that don't know, Alex, you made a slight detour recently with your music doc Zapper, which I enjoyed very much. And something I see in parallel with the YouTube effect is just the sheer volume of archival material that you had access to and the multitude of directions that 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 could have led you in. And one thing I've learned as a as a filmmaker is that there's a certain point along the editorial journey where the film starts to tell you what it's about and what should happen next and what its themes are. Um, but getting to that point can be daunting. Can you tell me about how you navigate those early stages of looking at what you've got and then working it out how to channel it into something cohesive and meaningful sure um i think that uh the you know i started making films pretty young and there were there were things about filmmaking that i really enjoyed uh uh and aspects of the process and certain types of films that i enjoyed um but it was always a fairly wide range of 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 things um I got exposed to a lot pretty early on and uh and I went to film school right out of high school. So, um I think with the with the uh for most of my career I I really you know because I started as an actor um so young and in a lot of different types of things as a kid on um, Broadway musicals and and then more ser you know serious dramas and other stuff. Um my approach to to the arts was always uh, it wasn't defined by kind of boxing yourself into a genre. It never really occurred to me that that's what you're supposed to do, you know? Um, as a character actor, you don't really do that. I mean, you, you can be trained to sing and dance, which I was, so you could do musicals and you could do very broad physical comedy, you could do uh, serious drama. Um, and you would do, you would take each one of those things seriously and work on them, but it never, uh, it wouldn't occur to you coming to, at, at acting that way that you're supposed to just do this or just do this or just do this. Um, and so I just have never approached, I've never really uh, approached my work that way. It's always um, what what interests me about this this story or this theme or this topic, if it's a doc, and then what is the right form for that story? Um, I think that's what led me to making a Zappa doc was I was really taken by Zappa's very eclectic, but not scattered, extremely serious approach to work, but it was very, extremely varied. Um, and, uh, and I think that there's a, a lot to be said for that. I don't think everyone needs to do that. I don't think I only like people who do do that. But, you know, I went from doing pretty serious stuff and then going into the really broad comedy stuff and then going back into serious stuff and, and, uh, the documentaries are usually mostly just about a passion and interest that drives me. So um, that kind of it was a two question uh, uh, that you had in a way. And the second question of, of the very difficult challenges you well know if you've done it yourself of making something cohesive and meaningful, as you put it. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I'd be presumptuous enough to, to know that it's meaningful, but um, I do believe that, um, you know, the whole process of making films and even um and writing is about making something cohesive i think that is true and i think that um sh the the amount of work that goes into this stuff is always about cohesion and clarity uh because the meaning comes out of i think my passion or anyone's passion in the subject and then that gives it meaning something i wanted to ask about zappa um like one thing i find unique to him is how disparaging he was of the music being around being made around him and how much of his lyrical output was basically taking the piss out of other people's music there's a couple of zappa records that i love but because of that i find it hard to go elsewhere with him and i've, I've often wondered why zappa so often wrote from a place of intellectual superiority what are your thoughts on that 
I think that, um, you know, I don't, I know that he's been accused of that a lot. I don't know if that's what was going on though. Like I, I, I was curious about that too, when I made the film, like what was driving him and why did people think he was so a feat? Um, I think that the reason his work can feel that way is that he wasn't really a rock and roll musician at all. Um, and I know that's, that can sound provocative given that he was one of the greatest rock guitar players of all time. So he obviously took the genre seriously, um, but he did not compose rock and roll music. I mean, Lou Reed very famously disparaged Zappa once by just saying the guy had no Elvis in him, right? Meaning he had no rock and roll swing. But I don't think Zappa was trying to make rock and roll music. I don't think that interested him at all. I think he was interested in doo-wop to a degree, but I think he was really more coming from a place of like the avant-garde classical composers um, that had preceded him. And so I think that can smack of superiority, um, just like, you know, Varez or Stravinsky or um, any of those composers probably would to a rock audience, you know, it seem highfalutin. Um, but to be fair to Frank, I really think that he was, that's what he grooved on. I think he really grooved on that. And I think that his sense of humor uh, a lot of what tweaks people about Zappa was he wrote this very serious music and had often extremely like puerile, you know, seemingly immature, juvenile lyrics, right? And but Zappa was all about contradictions and creating art that would have internal contradictions. And to me, that was another uh, part of his process was it was to intentionally destabilize people by having this extremely intense ornate music and like and then be singing about farts or something. <laughs> um, and uh, and I don't again, I don't think he was trying to sort of deflate or devalue his own music. I think that was part of the whole experience for him. It's a it's a trip. It's not for everyone. All of his stuff isn't for me either. But the stuff of his that I like, I really, really love. Same here. Yeah. I, you said you mentioned, mentioned contradictions there. And I think there's I feel like with the, the four Alex Winter documentaries that I've seen, um, there is a common thread of dissonance in those films. I I feel like maybe one thing that attracts you to something as a filmmaker is the idea that there are multiple truths and that there are dissonances in the material. Uh, absolutely. I mean, to me, that's kind of what art is. And I think it's kind of what human humans are. Um, and I think that what gravitated me towards docs was that I was doing a lot of narrative, which I still do. Um, but documentary allows you to to explore uh, multiple truths without having to to kind of uh, align yourself with one of them um, in a way that narrative doesn't so easily. Narrative, you really are expected to root for somebody, and even if that person is Travis Bickle or Tony Soprano, um, you still root for them. I mean, they may be an antihero, they may be doing bad things, but they're your hero, and you're rooting for them. And uh, and your villain is your villain. And it can be, it's very black and white in that way, no matter how blurry your edges get. Uh, documentaries are extremely nuanced. And uh, now that doesn't mean the audiences or the critics want them to be. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of times when you make a documentary that the, that your audience is kind of, is trying to see what side you're on, right? Like the most common journalist wrote question you as a doc filmmaker is, what was the message you were hoping your audience would take away from your film? I get that every single interview, frankly, and I'm just like, there isn't one. You know how hard we work to not have a message, like how painstakingly we craft these things to, to not tell you what to think. Um, so yes, I am very drawn to, you know, the, the sort of multi shaded aspects, internal contradictions of hu human nature. Um, and so you can have a movie like Deep Web about the Dread Pie Roberts, about Ross Ulbricht, who on the one hand I care very much for as a human being, and the other hand committed crimes and, and absolutely did commit crimes. And while the film can be sympathetic to aspects of his case that were really bad and, and unjust, it can also present the crimes. And I th that can be hard for audiences sometimes because they don't know what side you're on. And you know, oftentimes what you're saying is you're on the side of humanity and humanity is very contradictory. Yeah, I feel like uh, your films are certainly not didactic. And I was going to bring up Deep Web because I think the YouTube effect in Deep Web could make an excellent double feature. On one hand, like, what <laughs> the two most depressing movies of all time. <laughs> You're going to kill yourself afterwards, but yeah, sure. <laughs> Wait, well, I am I am drawn to pretty doom subjects in film right. as well. 
maybe part of that is like I'm I'm a social worker and uh, I know something somehow that can offset some of that work is really post apocalyptic <laughs> doom material. Yeah. So I, I watched the YouTube effect before I watched Deep Web, and so with the mm-hmm. YouTube effect, I was had had all these dissonant thoughts about regulation, the importance of regulation, but also, you know, like full disclosure, Alex, I'm really, really fucking skeptical um, when it comes to politics and when it comes to the Democratic Party. Uh, I've been really dismayed about how since Trump, it, we are in a world where you can't hold the Democratic Party to account anymore because it means you're pro-Trump if you do that. Um, and those discussions have been incredibly difficult to have. And so the idea of regulation in a post in a post Patriot Act world makes me worry. But at the same time, YouTube without regulation makes me really worry as well. And I watched yeah. Deep Web, and, and and I could see, okay, well, this guy is also really concerned about the government being cowboys and legal tap dancing, so that they can control the narrative at the same time. That's right. And this yep. is—I mean, you you hit dead on the the. The contradiction at the heart of, of the YouTube movie, which is absolutely what it is about, is this inherent contradiction. And um, again, people can watch it and say, oh, this movie is very pro YouTube. People, it's hilarious. Like they sometimes will think it's very pro YouTube. They'll think it's very anti technology. Um, it's really just a, about exploring the world that we're, that we're in at the moment, which is inherently contradictory to your point. And there is a, a conundrum right with with the advent of technology because on the one hand we need to be protected on the other hand what does that mean and what are the consequences of that protection and who's the one who's in charge of the protection right and let's say I me mean, to your point let's say you don't have any problem with the democratic party let's say you think they're awesome and they implement all these these restrictions and they shackle the net kind of like they're doing in the eu right now and that they're trying to do in the uk right and then an autocratic government takes over, and those are the tools they've got at their disposal when they when they take office. Um, so I think it's a a um, it for me like because the YouTube is is a very serious issue, um, and it's also a technology that I very much like. So I have internally contradictory attitudes about it. So I'm not sort of playing God and sort of just trying to you know play with marionette strings like i feel con- you know conflicted like you feel conflicted you just said it on the one hand we we know we need regulation on the other hand um and i've been saying this i mean you know, I, I wouldn't expect people to to dig in interviews i've given but this is my general mantra about regulation is that almost everything we've seen so far from every government is horrendous and would absolutely dismantle very important basic freedoms that we have that are not fuzzy um, they're very categorical. It would, it would, you know, when they talk about abolishing Section 230, which not to say someone shouldn't be trying to figure out how to reform certain amendments if, if they want to um, and certain bills, but Section 230, you know, it protects everyone from, from uh, not only liability, but from uh, not being able to make certain speech online, like abortion rights, like LGBTQ, like very important um, activist organizations, any minority, any marginalized group would be wiped out if Section 230 was wiped out. So, and Google wouldn't really bat an eye because they have so much legal muscle that they would just throw a building of lawyers at it and probably rumble along just fine. Um, So I think we are kind of humanity wise. That's why it was fun about making this movie for me in terms of my interests is that YouTube seems like such a kind of blase thing, but it kind of strikes at the heart of a lot of issues that we have with society at the moment, which is goes beyond technology, right? Which is freedom surveillance, you know, or freedom, you know, uh, non-freedom, actual uh, oppression. Um, you know, what does it mean to be an individual? What does it mean to have a voice? Uh, you know, how much are you really given a voice? Uh, is government good? Is government bad? Uh, all of these things are really, I think, the questions of the day that are very hard to answer. And that was part of the reason why I wanted to spend so much time in the world of, of YouTube. The film obviously is not a film about YouTube. It is a film about society. And yes. I kind of felt like, well, I'm glad you made this documentary because really I'm thinking how the, how do you navigate 
making this where like was this, was this a process where you thought you were working on one thing and then you realized oh i'm actually i'm not working on that at all yes and no i mean yes for sure like you don't have um you know if you're making a film and especially a doc you don't have all the answers going in you get a lot of answers and then you get a lot of non-answers and you get a lot more questions um it's kind of a blank canvas and so the film takes turns that you don't expect and you follow those those threads where they take you um but i would be disingenuous if i said that i wasn't very aware that we were making a movie about modern society because of course you are and um, you know, I came, I'm old enough that I got online in like the early eighties, uh, and very aggressively online in like 80, probably 84, 85, um, before the web, uh, was around in the, in the BBS Usenet era. And, um, there's actually a lot of people in Australia there at that time. Um, uh, and you, there was a lot of very, um, radical political groups, uh, on these news group channels. There was a lot of sort of art, philosophy, film, literature, you know, drugs, everything you can think of was there it was sort of pre everything we have online now was was there. Um, and so my entree to the Internet was that it was a reflection of society from the beginning, because I got online before the AOL, you know, before you got mail. Right. And it turned into this kind of other thing that it became this very commodified, commercialized, corporate branded space that we have today. So when I go on something like YouTube, and I had the same experience with the Silk Road uh, during the deep, the deep web work, I mostly just see people, you know, and I see people who are e either struggling or different demographics or uh, have a voice or have something to say. Um, you know, that's immediately what strikes me about any online community, including YouTube. So that's generally been my experience with YouTube. And when I sought out subjects to have in the film, that's why I went to Caleb Kane. That's why I went to Natalie Wynn. I immediately went to people who I knew had something to say about society and not just like, hey, I have a makeup channel, you know, or, you know, I unbox shoes every Thursday um, or all the other stuff you might see on YouTube from influencer. Getting back to the case, okay, so there's some re regulatory stuff that I've been, you know, thinking about a, a lot and, uh, like here in Australia, you might not be, you're probably not, not aware of it because, you know, in Australia, um, in 2021, the Australian High Court ruled that Australian media companies can be held liable for defamatory comments posted on Facebook pages. The majority yeah. decision was that just facilitating and encouraging comments amounted to participation in the communication of defamatory material, even if yeah. the original poster wasn't aware of the content of later comments. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Was this, were, you, were you aware of this? Yeah, I am. I've actually been following Australian um, legislation pretty closely because uh, Australia, the UK and the EU um, or probably the three places that are being, other than somewhere like China, where they just turn everything off, um, that is being the most aggressive in terms of um, regulation. The, the U.S. is very close behind. And they're, I can tell you right now, they are currently, and I'm hoping, and some of us are working towards changing this, they're currently following every bad um, policy that has been crafted in these other countries. And because it's the U.S., they're going to like spinal tap style turn it up to volume 11 right um so it, it is a pretty dire situation and i we talked i was actually at berkeley university just last night doing a panel with the movie with the the dean of law on our panel um you know talking about just this issue that like right now where we're at with the internet regulation is we are about to make things worse for the people that we're trying to help and we're going to make them better for the people that we're trying to to disempower um which is which is really tragic, and I think that we just need to do everything we can to circumvent that. I don't have any problem with um, with a disinformation super spreading cult leader being deplatformed, right? I guess <laughs> I guess we should all probably feel a little bit nervous about uh, a corporation having the power to direct and shape public discourse, and I'm even more well, nervous yeah, because they when... can replatform him, right? Like they can. They can deplatform him on Monday and replatform him on Wednesday, which is what they did with with Trump and Twitter, you know, and Facebook. And I mean, it's it's that's mercurial because it's really not coming from an ideological place. 
really not coming for user from user safety. It's coming from like PR outcry. So yes, because it's a corporation, they're not really out for the public good. That's not their their end game. It's the, that I would have to three hundred percent agree with you. Um, have you been following Missouri versus Biden? Yeah. So that yeah. and again in re in doing research, I don't do many interviews because I research the fuck out of things before I do it. It takes time and I work full time. Um, so I learned about this because I wanted to prepare for this interview. Um, so yeah, for, for the for the un, uninitiated, um, Judge Terry Doherty on July 4th um, put forward an injunction which barred social media censorship, which he described as arguably the most massive attack against free speech in the United States. And part of his ruling was finding that the White House likely coerced the platforms to make their moderation decisions by way of intimidating messages and threats of adverse consequences and significantly encouraged the platform's decisions by commandeering their decision-making processes, both in violation of the First Amendment. And then it's gone to appeal, and a lot of, a lot of those things have been starting to get dismantled. Yeah. Um, now, this is tricky because Missouri is a, is a mess. I'm actually, I grew up there. Um, I know a lot about the government. I was actually in Missouri last weekend. Um, uh, it is a mess and it is a very extremist right government. Um, and the extremist right is looking to use law to silence, actually silence free speech. They're looking to dismantle section 230 so they can stop. They've been brazen about it. There's a, the COSA, the uh, Kids Online Safety Act, which is uh, under a lot of uh, uh, controversy in the U.S. right now, you know, the, the far right has been brazen about the fact that they want to implement this bill not to help kids, but to to attack and, and deplatform trans and LGBTQ community in general. Uh, this Missouri bill is not dissimilar. The, the kind of spooky thing that the extremist right has done uh, leading up to the election year is that bill, uh, which is really just a censorship bill. Um, they, they mostly just want, you know, they, they make a claim that is not backed up by any data, which is typical of any propaganda tool, whether it's on whatever political side, um, that that social media uh, veers to the left, which it doesn't. It feels veers very hard to the right. That's been data metric for, for years. Um, so they really just want more of their speech and less of everyone else's speech. But the other thing they're doing that's very sinister is that they started to um to sue uh, academics and to silence academics who were talking about this information um in their classroom uh so what they're really looking to do is uh is stop the ability to talk about propaganda um and you can say well propaganda happens on both sides and the answer to that is absolutely it does which is why we need to be able to talk about propaganda right so um i'm very uh you know, I wouldn't call myself a free speech maximalist the way Musk does because he's lying and he really just wants to censor mostly far left and, and progressive and anti-fascist voices on Twitter, which is what he did as soon as he took, took over. Um, but I really am a big believer in, in the First Amendment and the ability to have free speech. And uh, I'm very wary of bills and other laws that are kind of claiming to be doing that while they're looking to do the inverse. And there's a lot of that going on in the U S right now, a lot. So when it, uh, yeah, you talked about disinformation campaigns taking place on both sides and that's, there's nothing, nothing new in, in, in that for anybody who's politically aware. So this is where I wanted to bring up Bellingcat for it for a minute, because after I, I'm aware that your film would have wrapped a, a year ago, thereabouts perhaps yeah yep mm -hmm. so again this is all the result it's a little of more just, yeah i was just doing lots of research and thinking and asking asking friends for things to think about and i found this article about bellingcat at the gray zone so if anyone who hasn't watched the youtube effect um bellingcat is referenced as having uh done a, a study which indicated something which actually seems pretty obvious to me which is that uh youtube was one of the key facilitating things for radicalization leading up to january 6. but i hadn't heard of bellingcat so I th what's the bellingcat study so the gray zone uh which is a you, you probably much more aware of the gray zone than i am i would imagine it's an independent media platform aaron Marte is one of the journalists there 
have you seen his article on Bellingcat from around May this year? Yep, I have, yeah. And okay, so just in summation for the uninitiated, for, for people listening, um, what Marte reports is that Bellingcat is funded by NATO states and their contractors, and it, uh, according to his research, regularly promoted propaganda that advances its backers' foreign policy objectives. And he said that since 2017, its top financial donors have apparently included the National Endowment for Democracy, which is a US government organization funded by Reagan CIA chief Bill, ba uh, Bill Casey, and it has served as a front for US intelligence operations including destabilization and regime change in targeted states. And he referred to a leaked assessment produced for the UK Foreign Office, which concluded that Bellingcat was somewhat discredited by spreading disinformation itself. I'm trying to read your facial expression as you're hearing this. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not a, I, uh, we don't have time for me to explain what the agenda of the gray zone is and why it is problematic, but I could talk to you about it for hours. Um, and I'm very close with the folks at Bell and Cat, and I assure you, other than them not being big fans of uh, authoritarian regimes like the one in Russia that Mate is so enamored with, um, they are good folks. <laughs> I will leave it at that. I so I so want to dive into this, but yes, I appreciate time is of the essence, and uh, I would be keen to discuss further because I have little doubt you would know 400% more about this there was a, I will characterize it like this. There was leading up to the 2016 election, there was an enormous amount of political discourse around NATO and around the whole idea of neoliberalism, um, some of which was valid, but a lot of which was getting exploited um, by, uh, by actors um, with agendas, some of which were traced back to Sputnik. And um, uh, specifically, like being paid by Sputnik. Um, after Trump's election, it became clear how much uh, activity Russia was engaging in to foul the waters of American discourse and to get us in a sort of a state of chaos. Um, and I, in my opinion, this kind of discourse feeds into that. A lot of it got discredited. A lot of what we saw happen with Glenn Greenwald and other voices that uh, may have had some legitimacy at a certain point, but basically fell hard into the right um once the money got good um a lot of people's agendas got very clear after 2020 and um what was initially like oh that's an interesting point of view became oh that's a point of view with an agenda um and i think one has to be careful um because there are there are um there are people who are really attempting to and successfully attempting to create um, a massive rise in far right nationalism around the world that is very, very bad for most people and is causing a lot of violence and will will strip away our freedoms. Um, and that doesn't mean if you believe in that, that you are suddenly some kind of like Patriot Act believing, <laughs> you know, flag waving, uh, mindless centrist zombie. It just means you really don't want the equivalent of Nazis taking over the planet again. Um, and I think that fight is very uh, critical right now. Um, and I do think it's kind of an all hands on deck fight to prevent that from happening. And right now I would say they're winning. I would say that we are dealing with the rise of far right autocracies around the world. And I think that is very bad for a lot of people. And at, at the same time, uh, look, I think about how when our governments, because our governments are such unreliable narrators, let's just say, when there's something truthful and important that they put out there, th that gets questioned because they've been otherwise unreliable. That's exactly right. Yes, it's the, I think that that's a really good point. And then I think that there are people who are being financed by very, very well-heeled donors who fuel that doubt. You know, and as Putin himself said, you know, the point of, of their propaganda is not to get you to come over to their side, it's to get you to not know what side to be on, right? It's to sow confusion. And that's not because Putin is some mastermind. He's like operating out of the same playbook that anybody has operated from, from time immemorial, going back to ancient Greece. So um, I think that that's the, 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 and the ability for the internet to fuel doubt and sow doubt and confusion. I think it makes it all the more important for what may have been easier in the past to go, oh, I'm gonna to listen to a handful of pundits on some stuff and form an opinion 
to really doubt the pundits too, like even these sort of fringe pundits or the radical pundits or the extreme pundits, you know, like to your point about Bellingcat, like look into this, like I'm a big stats person. I, I like data. So like, you know, if we look at a, at a Bellingcat study, well then we'll look at two or three other studies to get verification on that study. Um, and that's meaningful to me. And does that mean that I'm going to agree with everything that comes out of a place? But no, but I can usually sense where their agenda is, but it does take work. Like it takes work. And I think propagandists are counting on the fact that most people don't have the time or the ability to actually do the legwork. And this is a thing. There are propagandists on both sides, which. Well, there's propagandists on all sides, right? Because it's like, and especially now propaganda is, is like, this was the problem with YouTube is that it gets funded, right? So you can have this sort of seemingly golly gee whiz influencer talking about any form of politics, right? And you just think it's just they're just in their in their living room on a webcam and they've got millions of dollars of dark money funding behind them. And so there's, I mean, there's there's think tanks on every conceivable side fueling a lot of this material that we get. Um, and that's kind of, you know, I think that's the, in 2016, I lost some friends who went down certain rabbit holes. Some of them were like college professors, very bright people, went down sort of rabbit holes and kind of got lost in Magaville or other kind of bad, dumb, relatively dumb places that were, in my opinion, fascist, right? Which is kind of an inarguably bad place to be. Um, and I think that what happened was, is there was, to your point, there was so much confusion about what is truth, uh, who do you trust, uh, both sides are lying, um, and what I what I noticed that was interesting was what it gave what it gave rise to was Trump, right? Who was a, a, a an admittedly far right entity looking to create, and he still is looking to create a dictatorship and wipe out democracy. Um, so I think that what ends up happening, I think similar things happened back in with the rise of Hitler um, after the depression that Germany was sunk into. So I think that you can see what gives rise to fascism. Um, and I don't know about you, but like for me, being a middle aged guy with kids. You know, all of this sort of fun late night coffee talk about like, you know, is Russia good or bad? Are the Democrats good or bad? Like all of that goes out the window when I've got like when women have lost their reproductive rights because Dobbs has been reversed and trans people are being murdered. Right. And you have the ability for democracy to be stripped away. My 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 area of interest gets very narrow and specific. Um, And so that's kind of where I found myself around the time I made this movie was like, you know what? The glut, I can't really be fuzzy or gray anymore. You, you got it. We've got to get specific or we will end up losing the democratic process globally. I'm a social worker. So I'm, you know, I look at things very systemically, Alex. And I, like I said before, I'm skeptical and cynical. And I agree with you about those things that have led to the rise of, of Trump. But I see Trump as being a, a, a symptom and uh, yeah, I think, a pawn you know, even. Yeah. Yeah. And I think maybe if uh, if Democrats had, you know, had not become the centrist corporate party, then maybe we might not have Trump as well. And maybe if income inequality had been dealt with, um, maybe we wouldn't be in the place that we're in now as well. But at the same time, I well, feel I'm great- a Ben, I'm a socialist. So you and I would just end up blathering from the same side of the fence. So, yes, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen any of the anti-imperialist satire videos by James Rewald? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I hope that you had. Um, he and for anyone for anyone interested, his signature video is called "How U.S. Corporate Media and State Propaganda Advance Ruling Class Interests at Home and Abroad." And it, they're like ninety-second videos. And are you yeah. a fan? Yeah, yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah. So there's a quote at the end of that video. Uh, It's a Vladimir Lenin quote from 1921, which is all over the world, wherever there are capitalists, freedom of the press means freedom to buy up newspapers, to buy writers, to bribe, buy and fake public opinion for the benefit of the bourgeoisie. And I, I think that's aged pretty well. And it feels very relevant to the discussion about YouTube that you're inviting people into. Yeah, I think that what you have is, is, in this case, in the case of Google, again, a company that doesn't do all evil and has connected a lot of people and provides access to information to a lot of people around the world who would not have access to knowledge information without them. I don't just mean their search engine. I mean, literally the flow of 
of knowledge and and uh, and other voices around the world, which is what YouTube facilitates, which they've been very good at um, at promoting. However, sort of to the point of these videos that people watch them, or sort of anyone who's talking about the systemic problem with capitalist systems, the best will in the world, not that anyone ever has the best will in the world, but let's say they did, right? <laughs> with the best will in the world, you're, the, one of the reasons I wanted to make this movie is that is that people were kind of dismissing YouTube as a sort of like fun kind of video thing and not looking at the fact that A, it's the largest media platform on the planet by far, bigger than any film and TV conglomerate, any news conglomerate, um, certainly so any of these social media or whatever other tech platforms. It has more eyeballs on it than anything else on earth, right? So that's already got huge implications. Add to that, that it is not only owned, but it is specifically run by the largest tech corporation, a monopoly, right? So it's, it's ungovernable, it's unlegislatable, it's unregulatable um, on the planet uh, in terms of its, of, of its interaction with, with the people on the planet, in terms of users' interaction with this product. It's the largest. So uh, the implications of that are, are, are frankly stunning. And, and the one thing I will say working on the film, because uh, I kind of knew that statistically going in, but the longer you sit around those numbers and you look at how many data centers there are and like what they're building and where they are on the planet and, and what's coming and what their reach is and what their, their influence is, is it's almost, it's almost unimaginably powerful. Like if, for like, if you're a conspiracy nut, and even if you aren't, they're like the great Oz, right? <laughs> they're like this unimaginably huge, like black box that no one knows that much about that has more power than anything else on earth. And you're watching them, what they want you to watch 4.6 billion times a day. Um, I mean, you could just put that up on a card and you wouldn't even have to make the, the movie, right? It's so stunning. Uh, so in a sense that I think is what we're trying to, to get people to understand is like, wherever you fall on the kind of political spectrum, you know, whether you're a pro this guy or that guy or this outlet or that outlet or this po political person that like, you know, this is a giant corporatocracy, right, that we're all connected to um, that all that has that rules over both the parties like it doesn't care about left or right. Right. And in a way, it's almost it almost makes those things seem banal um, and those battles seem banal. And uh, and that's the future we're heading into. Um you know, that is basically the road that we're all willingly marching down. Um, and I think that that more than anything, I really wanted people to stop and just think about that, even if wherever you fall on the uh, on the spectrum, because uh, it's staggering. And therefore, I imagine you'll be following the antitrust case against Google pretty darn closely. I am, but I honestly don't look, I don't, you know, we talk about being cynical and I really try not to be cynical, but I really don't see that going anywhere. Um, I, I mean, there may be one day, one of them will, and maybe this will. Um, and there are much smarter people on antitrust. I mean, way smarter than me, both on the legal side and people like Cory Doctorow um, and other voices who are just very, very smart and worth listening to about antitrust and anti-monopoly um, and are very, very much more versed than I am. However, um, I am aware of how much lobbying power they have, how much they bought out. It's really interesting to me that sh that that Schumer here has been talking about wanting to get his arms around AI, um, and they're going to do this and they're going to do that, and then they announced, oh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a closed door summit with Elon Musk. I think like maybe I don't know, it was Peter Thiel. Like it's like a rogues gallery of villains, right? <laughs> and, and like that's what you're doing. Like that's your big AI fix. Is like. You know, um, so it's it's there's not, you know, I don't have a lot of faith that there's going to be any kind of meaningful reform anytime soon, which to to your point and mine may be a good thing. And if they don't do anything, they won't screw up anything either. Um, but it is from a standpoint of corporate power, monopoly power. It's daunting because I don't think someone said to me in a and a like, well, you've got this. You've got TikTok is up YouTube's backside. You've got you know, the antitrust law coming, like, isn't Google up against the ropes? And I was like, no, they're not up against the ropes. They're not up against, there's no, there is no rope. But look at their PR campaign. They've already got PR people putting stories in, in, into the New York Times, right? Saying, oh, Microsoft was much worse. And people don't really care about this anyway. 
Yeah, and frankly, I mean, there would be no Google without the Microsoft on antitrust case. So like that's what gave Google the power to become Google. So the whole thing is disingenuous. And uh, I don't think we're anywhere near that kind of um, that kind of oversight. I think it may come eventually. Um, and that's kind of like to your point about Bellingcat, like just I want to come back to that for a second. That to me, like, like, I think the more people are aware, especially in a post-2016, post-Trump kind of world, uh, post-Hillary Trump insanity, right? Uh, where the sort of like beast that of two heads collided and turned into this weird, horrible world we're in today. I think that like, you know, to try to not be tribal, right? To, to not to say to look in the good in all these things, but to sort of like, you know, you can read Mate and you can read Bellingcat, right? You know, you can maybe find some stuff in Mate you don't like. You may find some stuff in Bellingcat you don't like. Like, like the, the and that's sort of how I feel. And I know it can sound uh, within a certain area where I know people are trying to dig at truths. I guess that's my point. They're not being, it's not BS, right? Um, where it's not Ben Shapiro or someone who's just a grifter or Tim Pool or like they're just lying and making money by saying stupid stuff. Um, where they're trying to get at something I'm generally inclined to want to give someone like that some time, you know? So I think for someone like you, for like your friends that you're talking about, I'd rather someone be reading these people than not, you know, I'd rather people be getting a sense of what's going on. I'd rather people be looking at kind of the fringes of news that smart fringes of news than not looking at that stuff because out of that will come some clarity, I think. I'm aware that uh, you're running out of time, Alex. So uh, you're off Twitter now, which there's probably a whole other subject there, although I don't blame you. Twitter has just been burnt to the ground. Where's I couldn't, the- honestly, I couldn't, I couldn't justify monetizing this guy who was just brazenly going after trans people. Like, I just feel like he's a violence inciting He's a terrible human being. And by being on that platform, you're monetizing his platform, his megaphone. And I was like, I don't feel comfortable being part of the monetization of that, you know, because he doesn't allow for, I mean, even on YouTube, you can counter, you can have a far right influencer and a far left influencer and a socialist and an anti-capitalist. They'll all be there. They won't deplatform them. Musk will literally silence those people. At the same time, I've observed people going to threads and I'm like, well, how is, how is Zuckerberg any better? Why is now Zuckerberg getting the benefit of the doubt? He a he isn't threads is like a is like someone described it the other day and I can't remember who it was it was like the best interpretation of threads I've, I've heard from anyone where they said threads, threads is like when that fancy restaurant in your town opens an airport version of its of itself right <laughs> it's like this sort of like weird kind of simulacrum of something that isn't really the thing um, but honestly I do think there's a difference between I mean I don't like Zuck and I know people who are very very anti Zuck and I get it and what Facebook did with Cambridge Analytica is evil and and they're doing terrible things. Uh but for myself um uh Musk is an outward anti-democratic bigot who was literally it would be as if Zuck was on threads all day calling for the death of trans people, right? I wouldn't be there either. Um so and and there's a point at which I may get off of that. But it's you know we live in a world where you know most of our technological systems most of the systems the roads we go down have you know are paved in the blood of whoever whatever war was fought right if you go to the british museum we're just looking at stolen loot so i recognize that we live in a world of of complexity that is run by a lot of terrible people most airports are named after very villainous human beings um but there are areas where you cannot like outwardly monetize a, a a bad person so where where are you? Where can people find you? Uh, I mean, I'm on uh, Bl- uh, Blue Sky, um, which, contrary to popular myth, is not uh, controlled by Jack Dorsey. He actually just deleted his account the other day because I think there were too many weirdos there for him, which is exactly why I like Blue Sky so much. Uh, Blue Sky is good. Mastodon is good. Um, I'm there. Uh, I mean, I've got kids, so I'm on Instagram because I can, you know, I'm mostly there so I can share pictures of my family with my my other family members uh, so I, I admit i'm i'm part of the pro of the meta problem um uh, that's probably you know a good place to find me and alexwinder.com is my website and, and i answer emails if they get sent to me so as that's how we found each other so yes okay so <laughs> some quick 
quick uh, three quick wrap up questions for you. Which journalists or media outlets out there really speak to you, and who do you think really has their ear to the ground? I think individual journalists more than outlets, right? And I think we have to be like for a while. I was like, I got really mad at the New York Times because they were doing so much, so many terrible things, and they were involved in so many terrible things. But like, there's some really good reporters at the New York Times covering really important stories that no one else is covering. So. I'm a big believer in following in you know what Ben Collins and Brandy said not Zendrowski were doing, Brooke Binkowski. I mean, there are people who like broke the QAnon stuff and and are not party politic people who are just aiming for truth. Um, I have to tell you, I'm a I am a big Bell and Cat fan. I just mean I like every one of their stories. Absolutely I don't, but they they have broken some amazing stuff. Um and uh, and I generally, you know, find good stuff coming out of Mother Jones and and some of the places like that. Uh, some of the stuff the nation has been doing has been very important. But honestly, God, as bad as as Rolling Stone can be, they've broken. I mean, Teen Vogue is breaking. You know what Lexi is doing at Teen Vogue, the editor over there, is incredible. They've broken some of the most radical stories in the U.S. that are pro-trans, pro-labor rights. Uh, Real News is doing good stuff. Uh, Real News Network. Um, and Mel Buer and some of the writers over there, Kim Kelly, great, like pro labor, uh, writer, Tal Lavin. If you ask me these questions, I'll literally rattle off like journalists because I really am into like, who are the boots on the ground trying to get at the story, whoever they work for generally to your point has an ideology. And if you have an ideology, there's somebody probably terrible paying for, for the, for the lights to be on. All right. So I tend to be looking for who's telling the good stories wherever they are. Which filmmaker would you choose to make a documentary about you if such a thing happened? I would say no, my friend. <laughs> I'm no fool. <laughs> no filmmaker then. I don't think so. I really would rather, I'd really rather not have a documentary made about myself yeah. if at all humanly possible. I, f I had a feeling you might say that. Okay. La last question for you. What are you working on next, Alex? Um, well, honestly, we're in the middle of a very, very intense labor crisis. Um, and not just in Hollywood, but on the entire planet and certainly all over the U S you know, the United auto workers are, are up against it right now. The teamsters were up against up against a dispute with UPS recently. Um, it's a big deal. I mean, it has shut my industry down. People are losing their shirts. They're losing their homes, their health care. It's, it's a labor crisis that is absolutely related to the rise of, of oligarchy, largely tech-oriented oligarchy, that and, and rampant income inequality. And that is rearing its head because it's existential. Um, people literally can't afford to live anymore. Uh, and so I've been very, very involved in the strike. Um, and I'm also developing several other documentaries and a feature film. I've been doing some acting, which I can't talk about because of the SAG strike, which like, you know, brings me joy, <laughs> you know, makes the world let, feel a little less dystopian. Um, so there'll be more acting coming up, but I'm working on some big issue docs. I can't actually talk about at the moment. Um, but they do involve, you know, more, not from a te technology standpoint, but from where kind of we are societally right now, I'm looking at some stuff around that. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you, yeah. Alex. It's, it's been a real privilege talking with you. Um, I really appreciate your balanced, non-hyperbolic approach. And even in the way that you engage in Q&As um, and, and discussions, um, I'm observing how pro-discussion and pro-debate you are. And I, I do I do observe people throw you these black and white questions. What's your <laughs> message? And it's uh, it kind of reminds me a bit about it's, it, I've been watching some Dylan docos lately and how the media back in the sixties used to put to Dylan, what does it feel like to be the Messiah? It's like, yeah. right. Um, you're yeah. a filmmaker and you're a person who invites critical thought, which is what we need a lot more of. Yeah. And I think that starts from knowing you don't know, right. You don't know the answers. Like you don't, I think it's dangerous to fall really hard on, on, on something. I think you end up falling for something. And uh, we've seen that happen a lot in the last few years. So try to stay out of that sand pit. <laughs> Thank you. It's cool. been a real pleasure, Alex. Yeah. Thanks, man. I, I appreciate it. It was a great talk. It, it was, uh, it went in a much more robust direction than I expected, which I always enjoy. So thank you. Well, thank you. I'd love to do it again in the future when you've got new stuff coming out. Um, it'd be great cool. to meet again. Great. Yeah, much appreciated. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. Alex. See okay. you. Bye. Bye-bye.